There are two games that I'm looking forward to the most over the next few years, though we don't have a concrete release date for either of them. The first one is a game that we truly know next to nothing about, save for some minimal art, and I've covered it on the channel before. Former CDPR developers Rebel Wolves Don Walker, a vampire-themed dark fantasy game that I just have a good feeling about. The other game is Exodus, archetype entertainment science fiction game that we know much more about, although not too much. Now, science fiction games are not rare these days, and anyone in their right mind is right to be skeptical about hype, but it's still possible to look forward to things, and the premise of Exodus inspires a fair bit of confidence, at least in my opinion. I've already made a video where I talked about the people involved in developing Exodus, people such as James Olin and Drew Carpershin, who played essential roles in the development of Mass Effect, as well as Peter Hamilton, one of modern science fiction's heaviest hitters when it comes to writing. So now I want to talk more about the premise behind Exodus and why I believe it's so promising, especially in light of the many science fiction titles whose premises have been more than shaky. And I'll argue that the world building alone speaks volumes and offers reasonable hope. Many games, and especially many science fiction titles, set out to create a universe without any true underlying premise. What results from this is a kind of fill-in-the-blanks-as-you-go-along type of story, and this gives you the impression as a player that the game was not very well thought out. And here Starfield comes to mind. Starfield is nominally a science fiction game, although it does come from a different genre of science fiction, the so-called NASA punk genre. But setting this aside, it's very clear that the world building that went into Starfield was very poor. And it was a perfect example of the fill-in-the-blanks premise that goes into so many titles these days, especially science fiction games. If you played Starfield, you would, during the course of your playthrough, have to ask yourself what this game is ultimately about. And yes, although Bethesda games are fun, they are fundamentally different from many other types of RPGs, in the sense that they are ultimately a type of sim and not a deep story-driven game. But even these types of games require an underlying premise, and that premise is fundamentally lacking in Starfield. And the same could be said of many other science fiction games. The fundamental question that needs to be asked for any of these games is, what is the driving force behind the story? If we exist in a certain quadrant of the galaxy, what defines that area of the galaxy? What motivates the inhabitants there? Why do they do the things they do? This type of thinking is required, but sadly, many games of the present lack this. And this type of thinking in particular is especially important for the science fiction genre. Because many people would argue, and I would count myself among such people, that fantasy is fundamentally easier to pull off than science fiction, at least if you want it to be good. This would be my starting point, arguing for the potential of Exodus. Although relatively little has been revealed about the game, we do know a fair bit about the premise behind the world building. And there are two key elements that go into Exodus in terms of its world building and its premises that make it rise above other games of the genre, in my opinion. One is the much talked about concept of time dilation. In Exodus, you engage in space jumps that occur at near light speed. This has the effect that very little time has passed for you as the passenger, but a great deal of time has elapsed for the people you've left behind. Years, decades, perhaps even centuries can pass for the people back home, whilst only a few days, weeks, or months have passed for you. This, of course, opens up tons of storytelling opportunities and allows for a variance of stories that could otherwise not be told without the concept of time dilation. And you have to admit, very few science fiction games make use of time dilation as their fundamental concept. And much about what's been talked about in the context of time dilation with an exodus has been referring to the personal aspects that affect you and your loved ones after traveling, meaning that you leave people behind, and this has consequences for your interpersonal relationships. And that, of course, is very important. But what I find much more promising and fascinating about the premise of time dilation in this game is, frankly, how it affects the galaxy on a macroscopic level. We know Centauri is where the game takes place. So what happens to Centauri on the whole? There are many alien civilizations. Empires have been built wars have been fought, and many different political events have almost certainly come to pass as well. And let's just say you take a particularly long trip as a traveler in search of celestial treasure. Think then, potentially, of the galactic implications that entire societies may have collapsed during that time. Entire planets may have been ruined, and new forms of technology may have been developed. Indeed, I think the macroscopic, civilizational-wide consequences of time dilation are a lot more compelling and interesting than the personal ones. 
although the personal ones certainly are important as well. After all, imagine returning from a long journey, only to find out not just that your family is gone, but that your entire planet has ceased to exist. That would be harrowing to say the least. Now all RPGs, whether they're science fiction or fantasy, have a state of the world. Baldur's Gate 3, for example, one of the more recent and great RPGs of our time, happens to be a fantasy RPG set in the Forgotten Realms in the Dungeons and Dragons universe, and has many different states of the world depending on what you do. Did you side with the druids or the goblins? Did you embrace the dark urge or reject it? And this of course also applies to Mass Effect as well, which was famous for your decisions being carried over from one game to the next. Did you kill Rex on Vermeer? Did you side with the Quarians or the Geth? Did you let Ashley die on Vermeer? I certainly hope you did. And all these decisions you can make, of course, produce different states of the world, and consequently different states of the game for you as the player. And that's both interesting and essential, but what time dilation does is that it ups the ante significantly. Because here we're talking about states of the world, or in this case, states of the galaxy, that are potentially vastly different that you missed out on in the sense that you were not there when these states were brought into existence because you were too busy traveling. It adds an element of surprise that would otherwise be lacking, as potentially you have no idea what might have happened in the years you've been gone, which have only been weeks for you. So beyond the storytelling aspects as they relate to personal character interactions and the issues that arise from time dilation, I think the potential for civilizational or galaxy-wide events that are massively altered or changed after you've engaged in time dilation is Exodus' biggest strength when it comes to the possibilities for storytelling in the game. But I don't actually think that time dilation is the only selling point of Exodus, to be perfectly honest. There's another heavily overlooked aspect of the game that a lot of people, surprisingly enough, have expressed disappointment in. Namely, the fact that, although there are many aliens in the game, virtually all the alien life has, at least in terms of their origins, a terrestrial starting point, which is to say they originally came from Earth, and many people heard this and immediately expressed their disappointment. And I partly get that, especially when you're coming from a universe such as Mass Effect, where you have a lot of varied alien life that evolves separately, and they all play different roles in the galaxy. But what's really cool about Exodus, in my humble opinion, is the fact that all these aliens and all these different species have a terrestrial origin. This is because, in addition to time dilation, it's very clear that an important aspect of this game involves biotechnology and genetic engineering. Because as far as we can tell, something like 25 to 40,000 years have elapsed when it comes to the differences between the people, i.e. the humans who first arrived in the Centauri Cluster, and the alien species you encounter are a result of this. 40,000 years, for example, is substantial enough to lead to different levels of evolutionary adaptation in terms of evolutionary theory. Lactase persistence, the ability to digest and consume dairy products as an adult without problems, is a mutation that is less than 10,000 years old, for example. But what's implied in Exodus is that in addition to natural adaptation and natural developments that arise from conventional evolutionary processes, all the aliens you encounter in Exodus, inasmuch as they're radically different from Homo sapiens, have engaged in and made copious use of gene editing technology, basically genetic engineering. And it's topical, because in 2024, in the real world we inhabit, such technology already exists, albeit in its nascent form. Technologies such as CRISPR-Cas9 that literally allow you to edit and change the code of life itself, DNA. And when we're talking about a science fiction game like Exodus, where the technology is vastly beyond what we can even conceive of, the possibilities become virtually endless. And so I think it's absolutely fascinating that within the 40,000 years that have elapsed, in addition to natural evolutionary processes, you have this implementation of genetic engineering that fundamentally changes these beings into new species. But that's not where the fun ends. Because we know that the protagonist, June, is some combination of celestial DNA and human DNA, a combination we can only imagine to be quite rare in this setting given that humans are in a state of conflict with the Celestials. And this also implies that you, the protagonist, then have access to Celestial-only technology that humans with human-only DNA could not access or make use of. But conversely, there are also things that only humans can make use of because of their DNA. And this is where the concept of the silicate comes into play. Silicates are alien organisms that can bond to humans to form a dangerous but symbiotic relationship with them. Nobody knows exactly what ancient culture gave rise to the silicates. The true origins of the silicates remain a mystery, even to this day, 
We do not even know if they were created by a long forgotten civilization, or if they are true alien life that evolved independently in Centauri, or perhaps somewhere else. For celestial silicate eggs appear as rare but simple crystals or gems with no power or significance. Only with the touch of a human does the symbiotic bond awaken, allowing the silicate to hatch and merge with human flesh. For most, this merger is fatal, but for a precious few, it is transcendent. Once a human bonds with a silicate, their transformation is radical and permanent. As the saying goes, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. The symbiotic union of humans and silicate creates a new being known as a demon. The individual skin changes, becoming translucent, but virtually impervious. Their musculature evolves, giving them incredible speed, strength, and other physical abilities. They become something greater, something even the celestials fear. Silicates are humanity's leverage. Demons don't need weapons. They are weapons. They give humanity a fighting chance against the Celestials. They even the playing field. Since silicates will only bond with humans, there are some who see them in a religious light. They believe human silicate coexistence was preordained. It was meant to be and brought to fruition by some higher power. Others just see it as a fortunate break for humanity, a piece of good luck to offset all the hardships that we've endured. However, silicates are not without their drawbacks. Demons are prone to intrusive, violent thoughts and urges. Some theorize that silicates are speaking to their hosts through these dark musings, influencing and changing their behavior to suit their own dark purpose. Others feel the silicates merely allow demons to tap into the primal shadow that exists within all humanity, buried beneath a veneer of civilization and manners. But whatever reservations humanity may have about silicates and demons, one thing is certain. The Celestials fear them far more than we do. That alone validates their true value to our cause. And beyond this, you have a class of animals called the Awaken that have been genetically engineered for hyperintelligence, and much, much more. So we can see, based on this, that the role of biology and genetics is going to be a very important one in the game, and we can furthermore deduce that the protagonist June will probably be able to become a silicate. If you look at some of the promotional art for the game, which you can see here, you can see three different figures. Look at the one on the left. It's not illogical to infer that this might be a version of June that is in fact a silicate you can play. And in the middle, you can see what is presumably a normal human male. And on the right, you can see a female version of June. But if you look carefully, she has some very interesting art, perhaps tattoos, and possibly even some kind of body modification. So this suggests that, although you're playing a fixed protagonist called June, you do have a number of options. And what your June looks like, apart from the fact that you can either play a male or female, that's a given, might depend on the choices you make in the story. And again, this relates to the theme of biotechnology and genetic engineering. Of course, other aspects of the game have been revealed, such as the intrigues that all human beings engage in when it comes to their political machinations. In fact, the footage you're seeing here is the Green Worlds trailer, which is seemingly a depiction of some humans who have been deceived by their fellow human beings, sent intentionally to a toxic planet where they can die after having been lied to about its habitability. But essentially, what I'm trying to convey here in this video is that already with very little having been revealed, the premise of Exodus is extremely robust. The ideas behind it are compelling, you just don't see them implemented in the vast majority of science fiction games. The dual combination of time dilation and genetic engineering is just not something that you see very often. So rather than getting upset at the lack of Krogans or Solarians or Turians or their equivalent, I think it's going to be a lot more interesting to see these differently evolved humans, i.e. Celestials, that have been heavily genetically engineered and modified. And according to the developers, some of them are going to be very, very different looking, sometimes radically so. Now ultimately, obviously, whether the premises are strong or not, these premises and the story elements that go into them need to be conveyed well. The writing has to be good and strong. But when you consider you have guys like Drew Karpishan, who's writing directly for the game, and Alexander Hamilton, the master of science fiction in the modern era, who's consulting for the game, and who has a novel that's coming out in September of this year, which will serve as the world's introduction to the universe of Exodus, I think the chances are looking very good indeed. So I know if you've decided to check out this video, you probably have an interest in Exodus. So do let me know what you think is the most compelling thing that you've seen thus far in the game. Do you find 
time dilation the most interesting aspect? Or like me, are you a real geek for the biotechnology, genetic engineering angle that's almost certainly going to feature very prominently in the game? Or is there something else in the game that you've noticed that's caught your attention? Do let me know in the comment section. And as always, thank you for tuning in. If you like my content, you can leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe. It'd be much appreciated, as it really helps out the channel. And I will check you out next time. Take care.